Thanks. Brilliant. So, hi everyone. Welcome to the Deep Neural Networks uh, course. This is lecture eight, if I manage to count the number of lectures correctly. Um, and today we are going to talk about recurrent networks, RNNs. And on Thursday, which is the next lecture, we are going to continue talking about RNNs. But uh, I think the difference between this lecture and the next one is that this is going to be focused more on what RNNs are, how they work, what problems arise when we try to train them, and how do we fix those problems. Whereas the next lecture is going to be more focused on specific applications and how RNNs have been applied, how they have been extended in uh, particular very successful applications. Uh, so um, let's get started. Um, we have talked, uh, both Nick, um, also Neil and I, whenever we talked about neural networks so far in this course, they have all been following the same formula. So for example, we've always used some variant of a multi-layer perceptron, which is uh, essentially layers of a linear operation on your inputs um, to the layer, followed by a pointwise nonlinearity, and then you had layers like this put on top of one another. So it was always linear operation, pointwise nonlinearity, linear operation, pointwise nonlinearity. Um, so, and this is also true for convolutions because convolutions are just a special type of linear operation as, as Nick explained in the last lecture. Uh, but generally speaking, there was nothing more crazy happening uh, in terms of the building blocks of the network. So this is my second bullet point here is that when we talk about RNNs, we are going to see many, many more types of building blocks in building neural networks that don't follow that formula. So we are going to look at multiplicative interactions and gating, and we're also going to look at skip connections. So don't worry if these don't mean anything to you. I hope that I will be explaining them. Um, the, the other big difference that I probably should have started with given that that's my first bullet point is that now we are going to also consider a different type of input to these neural networks. So far, we have always assumed that the input is generally described as a vector or a tensor that has fixed dimensions. Uh, so it can be an image, for example, of a certain size. Now we are going to talk about sequences uh, and sequences of arbitrary symbols or sequences of vectors or sequences of anything. The key difference here is that um, a sequence can be of arbitrary length. So we, uh, we will be able to evaluate these neural networks, uh, which are called RNNs, on short sequences as well as long sequences. So think about the, I think the main application for RNNs is, is text where you are dealing with sequences of symbols, sequences of uh, usually characters in an alphabet. And you uh, want to be able to uh, to run your neural network on a short sentence as well as on a long sentence or on an even longer document. So that's going to be a big difference from what we have considered before. And then finally, um, all the time we were talking thus far we, about how you train neural networks, we talked about empirical risk minimization in a specific setting of uh, supervised learning. So we always, ha always had input desired output pairs and our neural network was making a prediction and we compared that prediction to the desired output or the target or the label that we wanted to predict. Whereas here in one of the applications that I'm going to talk about, we are going to do maximum likelihood training of a probabilistic model that we define with a neural network. And uh, this is within the scope of what's called generative modeling. So we are going to learn to generate sequences as well as to classify them uh, as before. So the first thing is that we are going to consider sequences. Uh, generally, uh, the input to the network is going to be a sequence of uh, symbols, X1, uh, obviously X2, and then X3, all the way up, up to X capital T. Sorry about the typo here. Uh, and capital T can be different for the different data points that we are considering uh, running our network on. Um, and sometimes the sequence ends with the end of string symbol. Uh, so this tells, uh, well, this doesn't tell the network anything, but this is a, a, a special character or a special symbol that we can use to encode the fact that this, the, the sequence has ended. And we can use 
RNNs, which, I'm, which is today's topic, for a, a lot of different types of applications. We can uh, do sequence classification where the input is a sequence of things and the output is can be, say, a binary uh, or a discrete label. Uh, you can use these types of networks for sequence generation. So, for example, natural language generation, when you want to, uh, for example, given um, first half of a sentence, you want to complete that sentence or you want to sample likely completions of, of a sentence. And finally, you can use them in this highly successful uh, application when you are learning to map sequences to other sequences. And the canonical application for this would be natural language translation. You want to map English uh, sentences to, say, German sentences, which both of them are sequences of characters from similar alphabets. The, the key tool that we are going to talk about today are recurrent neural networks. And this is usually the picture that is shown, although I don't tend to like this particular way of drawing a recurrent neural network. Um, on, at the bottom, you see the input. Uh, I use this notation one column T to show that this is a sequence of uh, symbols uh, all the way up to, to time T. And you have these hidden layers. You can have multiple hidden layers. I drew two of them, uh, but in general, you can, this can be arbitrary number, obviously. And then at the end, uh, or the top of the network, out comes some output y, which is uh, the same length as the input sequence, 1 to t. And in this way of drawing things, these red arrows that are circling back to the hidden layers show that the hidden layers value at time t depends on its value in the previous time step. And the, the drawing that I like much more than this is the view when we unroll this computational graph in time. So now for each time step, one, two, three, all the way up to capital T, I have a different column. And this shows how the different outputs at the different time steps are, are calculated from uh, the sequence of inputs. So the first input x1 is uh, ingested by the network and uh, it's it, after some nonlinear transformation, uh, it, it uh, can you see my cursor? I hope you can just nod if you can see my cursor that I'm pointing at. Can you? No. Yeah, we can see the cursor. You can see the cursor, okay. So the, uh, thank you. So the first um, sequence, the first element of the sequence uh, gets, um, determines the first value of the hidden state uh, at time step t and lay, at layer one. This hidden state then gets, uh, that becomes the input of the hidden layers above. Uh, and eventually the first output y1 is, is created from these uh, hidden states or these hidden layer activations. When we see the next data point uh, x2 or the next element in the sequence, that gets combined with the previous value of the layer activations at the, at the corresponding layer. So when we are calculating h1 of two, h12, which is the activation of the first hidden layer at time step two, we take into account the activation at time step one of the same layer, and we take into account the inputs to that layer, which in this case is the, uh, is the second uh, input symbol x2. And the, uh, the outputs of each hidden layer become the inputs of the next hidden layer, just like in a multi-layer perceptron. So generally, if you have a, a sequence of t inputs, this network would produce a sequence of t outputs. Uh, sometimes we care about only the final output, yt. So for example, if you want to classify this sequence, say this is a sentence, character by character, uh, we only care about a single prediction. And sometimes we just use a single one of these y values, yt. Uh, and in other applications, we might want to consider uh, the whole sequence of outputs that the network has generated. In yet other applications, it is actually the hidden state activations after having consumed the entire sequence, which is, which is of interest. And this is going to be the case in uh, encoder decoder style architectures that, that we will talk about in the next lecture. 
these these different ways of uh, thinking about uh, sequences or learning with sequences or making predictions with sequences is illustrated uh, in this figure from uh, Andre Karpathy's blog post, which is a very influential blog post on RNNs. It's now over five years old, but it was a very widely distributed um, blog post about RNNs that I recommend everybody reads. Uh, I think if, if uh, for nothing else, it's a very good historical uh, account of how surprising the performance of RNNs were in 2015 when they first started to, uh, to, to become mainstream. So these different modes of operation are on the left hand side, we have the one to one mapping. So this would be the, the normal multi layer perceptrons that we've talked about. We have a single input and we have a single output. Or we can uh, have a one to many type of uh, mapping where we have a single input for example, an image, and we want to generate a sequence. And an example of this would be image description generation. So we have an image and we want to generate, say, a text description describing what's in the image. Uh, and often that would be, uh, that could be cast as this one to many type of mapping like this. Um, text classification, when you have a text input, for example, or a sequence as an input, and you have a single output, falls into this many to one category. Uh, and then you, you can do many-to-many -many mapping. Uh, and broadly speaking, you can do it in two ways. You can uh, um, either uh, first let the, this neural network consume the sequence of inputs and then run it a little bit longer for it to consume, uh, to, to produce a sequence of outputs. So this is called sequence-to-sequence -sequence, uh, mapping. This is what we are going to talk about in next lecture. Or uh, in some applications like text generation, you can actually use um, the, um, the symbols that are the, the, the network outputs at each time step uh, as a, something that directly corresponds to the symbols that uh, the network receives as an input at that particular time step. So I'm going to talk about this final uh, many-to-many -many mapping and particularly the the task of generating se uh, sentences or generating sequences of objects uh, with a neural network and with, a, with an RNN. The goal is now going to be uh, to model the distribution of sequences. So we have, um, I think for simplicity, I'm just going to call these sentences and I'm going to say that each X, X1, uh, X2 and so on is a different character in, in the sentence. And I want to describe the distribution of possible sentences that I might see in the world. Uh, and this is the joint distribution of characters at the different locations of, um, of the sentence. And here I assume that probably the last, uh, last character in the sentence is something like the end of string special character that denotes the fact that the sentence has ended. Or maybe it's a full stop or a period or something like that. How do we model something like this? In RNNs, we, we model sequences, um, distributions over sequences in an autoregressive fashion, which is simply writing this joint probability distribution as a product of conditional probabilities. Uh, so we always, um, in this factorization, uh, we first define uh, the, some probability distribution over the first character uh, that's not conditioned on anything. What's the, the most probable, or what are the most, yeah, what are the most probable first characters that you would encounter in a sec sentence? And then subsequently, you always model the probability distribution of the next character given the characters that you have already generated. So, for example, this describes the probability distribution of uh, the T minus first or T minus uh, the, the symbol at position T minus one given the prefix. Uh, all the way from the first character to the character at position t minus two. And you have all of these uh, similar terms like this in this decomposition. If you want to model something like this with, a, with an RNN, a recurrent neural network is very well suited uh, to model distributions this way. And this is the picture that, that goes with this type of uh, sequence model. We're going to um, to start with some initial value of the hidden state. So previously I started drawing H11 in the first figure. 
um, it also makes sense to start uh, drawing some kind of initial value for these hidden states, uh, which can be random, before I start ingesting the first uh, letter of the sentence or the first character. And uh, if I run, uh, run these, these hidden layers and I evaluate what, it's out, what, what it outputs, uh, I will make this RNN output a probability distribution, a probability distribution over characters. And this is going to be a probability distribution over the first characters, uh, first character of the sentence. I haven't fed this RNN any characters from the sentence before. Now the first uh, character comes in, let's say it's a capital T. I'm going to uh, ingest that into the, uh, to the network. Um, the network is going to output uh, a probability distribution of the second character given the first character. So this X1 uh, comes from the first, uh, first step of the input or the first uh, character of the input. And now this is going to uh, predict what the next character is going to be. If the first character was a capital T, then for example, the second character is very likely to be a lowercase h because the is a very common starting of a sequence. And then so it goes, we inject the next character from the sequence. And again, we make a, a one step forward prediction about what character do we expect to see next? And what's the probability of each of the next possible characters? So this is just a model um, that, you know, that you, can, you can randomly initialize. The key difference from the picture that I drew here is that now I interpret the output of the model as probability distributions. I can do this the same way as, um, as for example, I interpret the output of the model as a probability distribution in a multi-class classification setting. How am I going to train this model uh, so that these predictive distributions, when you multiply them together, somehow describe the, the distribution of actual sentences that you're likely to see in your data sets. Well, for that, we need, to, um, we need to define a loss function. And this is a, a rather complicated drawing of what's going on here when we train an RNN with maximum likelihood training. So to explain, uh, the, at the zeroth time step, the network outputs its prediction for what the first character uh, is likely to be. It gets compared to the actual first character, x1. Uh, so we substitute x1 to this probability distribution. We take the logarithm of this probability and we, uh, we kind of add it to all these other outputs from, uh, from the different time steps. The, at time step one, the network makes a prediction about what the second character is likely to be given the first character. It gets compared to the real second character x2. We take the logarithm of the predicted probability and then we add it to this, uh, this accumulator or, or uh, um, accumulated uh, log probability. And we keep adding these uh, log probabilities together and adding the log probabilities together is the same as uh, multiplying the probabilities, which was, um, which was on, on this side here. So I could equivalently write this equation. If I take the logarithm of both sides, the product on the right-hand side becomes a logarithm. So this is why these logarithmic, uh, logarithms of these probabilities get uh, added up uh, to form the empirical loss, which in this case is the likelihood of this sequence. And so once we define the scalar loss function, uh, we can then backpropagate this loss, which is the likelihood um, or the negative likelihood because we want a loss function, we want to minimize it in, in deep learning. Uh, and we, we then train the parameters of, these network, of this network uh, in order to make these probabilistic uh, predictions of the next character as closely resemble the real distribution of sequences as possible. I'm going to pause here in case there were any questions or there are any questions. There's been a good question, um, mm -hmm. friends. You long, do you want to unmute and ask your question? You'll be on the video if you do, but, so I'm happy to ask it. But yeah, go ahead and unmute if you happy to. Um, yeah, so, so my question was about like um, how, how it's possible to um, 
have like sequence to sequence. So, so I think over here, um, the number of inputs and like um, outputs, okay, that's sort, of, sort of the same, but okay, I think it seems to have been sort of addressed in the previous slide where you had, um, where you first have the inputs and then like afterwards you have the outputs. Like, okay, I'm not sure whether it's related to the encoder yes. decoding. Yeah, yeah. uh, thanks for the question. I, I read your question now in the chat. So I think this picture kind of addresses it. Uh, yeah. The way you deal with sequence to sequence mapping where you have different length sequences and this happens in translation is that uh, is that you you run the network in this mode. You first ingest one of the digest one of the sequences that creates a hidden state and then you use the the resulting hidden state to initialize the hidden state of another RNN, which is the decoder RNN that then generates a sequence and that can generate a sequence that, can be arbitrarily long. It doesn't have to be the same length as the input sequence. Uh, whereas in the, the final way of using the network, the output is always the same length as the input. So that's the sequence to sequence way. This is how you can achieve different uh, length um, sequence to sequence mapping. So I'm gonna go on, but if anyone has any question, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, so this is how you can train a, an RNN for um, generative modeling, which is modeling the distribution of sequences. And how you can then use this uh, generative model or probabilistic model to, to sample random sentences uh, is illustrated here. You, it's the same neural network as before, but we didn't, don't need this loss part anymore. We throw away the loss function because it's already been trained. So now what we do is uh, we start from some hidden state uh, H0 that uh, outputs us a distribution over the first characters. We sample a character from this distribution P uh, over the first characters. And then we take this sampled X1, the first character, and we uh, use it as input to uh, the RNN itself. So we feed the sampled character back into the neural network itself. Then it's conditioned on that first character that it sampled. It's going to, um, again, define a random distribution over the next character. We sample once again, the second character X2. We feed it back to the network and we keep doing this uh, until the network decides to sample an end of string character, for example, or whenever we decide to stop this. Um, now, one thing that people often do is you can, um, so sometimes the problem with, with RNN sampling is that if in these distributions you are so unlucky that you, um, you sample a very uh, unlikely next character, the RNN will have a very difficult time recovering from that. So if you, for example, um, sample a particular misspelling of a word, uh, that is that is uncommon, which can happen by chance, uh, if your because your probabilistic model is not perfect, then the RNN is going to, you know, completely shift its hidden states into a territory that is never seen before in real training data. So one thing that people do to prevent this is by um, making sure that when they are sampling the next character, they. Um, they uh, change this probability distribution by making it lower temperature, which means uh, raising the, the elements to a, to a certain power. Uh, so if you, if, you might, if you see temperature being mentioned in text generation, this is what the temperature parameter means. So essentially you, you lower the entropy of these predicted distributions, which means that uh, you're going to be even more likely than this probability distribution suggests to pick the most likely next character to complete the sentence. So this reduces the diversity of sentences that you will randomly sample, but at the same time, it helps avoid these situations where you, uh, where you sometimes sample complete, um, um, completely wrong sentences because you, uh, you were unlucky in your sampling. And one, um, again, I'm returning to this blog post from 2015 by Andrei Karpathy, which is called the unreasonable um, power, is it? Um, oh, now I, now I forget, but this is a name that, that is so, that is everywhere. Reasonable effectiveness? 
unreasonable effectiveness of recovery. It's always unreasonable effectiveness ever since the unreasonable effectiveness yes, of maths. Yes, yes, but I, I think I used it so many times was practicing this lecture that I actually, the result of it was forgetting it. Um, so unreasonable effectiveness of recurrent neural networks is the title of this blog post. And it's been you know, shared very widely and a bunch of people named their papers uh, on the unreasonable effectiveness of something, something uh, since that, that blog post came out. So what Andre did here is he actually trained a a character-based recurrent neural network on uh, to model text. And he showed examples of what these neural networks are able to learn to generate uh, when, when trained on various text corpuses or corpora. So here's an example of Shakespeare um, being generated. These things are not as, I mean, if you have seen more recent examples of text generation, which I assume many of you have, uh, these are not particularly amazing by today's standards, but back in the days, these were very surprising uh, to a lot of the community that you could get these very simple networks that don't know anything about words, they don't know anything about grammatical structure, they only predict the next character from the previous one, and you can get them to generate grammatically relatively okay sentences, uh, and also global structure, for example, you know, uh, this is generated character by character. So nobody told this RNN that there should be different paragraphs and there should be like names of characters and so on. Um, another example is when you train it on Wikipedia, the RNN happily learns not just the text but also the special characters that you were likely to see in Wikipedia. So for example, it can generate these random uh, you know, mark, mark down type of syntax uh, with various, which is also syntactically correct and also semantically somewhat meaningful. It can also sometimes uh, generate random XML uh, type of tags. This is also from when trained on from Wikipedia data. Um, Andre even tried to train this on LaTeX sources. Uh, so I assume that many of you will be familiar with LaTeX. This is the source code of a book on something, probably geometry or something. Uh, and the network produces the LaTeX source, which uh, as Andre describes is almost compilable by LaTeX. So if you have to change a couple of things because it doesn't compile, it uses the wrong commands here or there, uh, but with a few changes, you can get them to compile. And these are the compiled documents uh, where the source code was character by character generated from an RNN. But um, doing this wasn't that easy. Um, so when, to, uh, for Andre to generate these uh, results and generally when, when people achieve good results with RNNs, they didn't just use the vanilla RNNs, arbitrary uh, extensions or the, the simple extensions of um, multi-layer perceptrons to, uh, to do this. And that's because uh, vanilla RNNs, the ba most basic versions of our RNNs forget too quickly. And what I mean by forgetting too quickly is that um, as the characters of a sentence are consumed by the RNN, uh, the characters that, that uh, appeared in the beginning of the sentence uh, suddenly will have less and less influence on the subsequent hidden states of the neural network. So essentially by the time, for example, the RNN would get to uh, predicting what the ending of the sentence is, it has already forgotten what the beginning of the sentence was. And related to this property of RNNs forgetting very quickly is the problem of either vanishing or exploding gradients. Uh, so vanishing gradients is when um, the gradients in a neural network become vanishingly small. Um, and this happens also in very deep neural networks uh, when you stack a lot of uh, linear, a lot of layers on top of one another the gradients of the parameters at the bottom layers with respect to losses measured at the end of the network can become very small or in other cases can become ex ex exponentially large. And this can cause all sorts of problems when training neural network. So neural networks. So I have uh, this illustration here of the forgetting problem. You should see my collab notebook and I'm increasing the font size. Uh, and this, this is going to be a very live demonstration, which can go wrong in many different ways uh, of the forgetting problem in RNNs. But this is also meant as a demonstration of how easy it is to play with RNNs 
using Google Colab and also using you know, nice libraries like Torch. So I'm going to use Torch, PyTorch for, for this. And here I simply imported uh, the Torch library and the torch.nn library, which is the neural networks library of Torch and also some plotting utilities um, that are not particularly exciting here. In order to, uh, to define an RNN in Torch, uh, it's very simple. You can just use the nn.rnn um, class. And this has three parameters that you have to specify. You have to specify the input size, which uh, for this illustration of vanishing gradients, I'm just going to use uh, a one-dimensional input. So each input in the sequence is going to be a one-dimensional scalar. And then I have to specify the hidden layer size, which I'm just going to make 20 for, uh, for, for simplicity and speed. And then you can specify the number of layers. Uh, so this is the number of layers between the input and the output sequence, which I'm going to just say is two. And there you go, you have a model initiated with random weights uh, that implements this RNN model. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to generate some random input sequences. So I'm going to say input equals torch.rand and n. And the size of the, the input that you have to give this RNN is going to be um, sequence length. times batch size times um, the dimensionality, which we, have, which we have already decided to be one. So I'm going to make a sequence of length 100. This is bad practice, uh, we already know, because it had to be a power of two. But anyway, uh, it doesn't matter too much in this toy illustration. Um, then the batch size, I'm just going to use one. Uh, so I. I don't actually need a mini batch of examples. I'm not going to train this thing now. I just want to investigate this randomly generated recurrent neural network. And uh, I have a dimensionality of one. So that's my input. And now I can, uh, in PyTorch, I can simply calculate the output. And uh, I'm gonna tell you why this is here later. And I can just simply call RNN as if it was a function on the inputs. This is the functional, um, functional syntax for, for PyTorch. Why I put this uh, catch all, I don't really know what the name of this, uh, this operation is in Python, is because the RNN also outputs not just the outputs, but also the hidden layer activations uh, when, when you do this. And I don't actually want to look at the hidden layer activations now. I can look at the size of the output um, and it's a hundred because uh, that's the sequence length times one, which is the batch size. So for each sequence that I would have uh, added to input, it would have outputted a different, um, different sequence. And the dimensionality is 20 because I uh, decided the hidden size to be 20 at all layers. Now what I want to do is I want to see what if I take just one of these hidden unit activations and I want to see how the value of that hidden unit at the last time step depends on the inputs. So I'm going to take the, the last activation. So uh, at time 99 of the, uh, of the first example in the batch of say the first hidden unit. This is going to be a scalar. Uh, it's minus 1.92. Oh, well, that is actually a nice number. Uh, isn't this, this, this has something to do with America. Um, so what I want to actually look at is how this output changes if I change, uh, if I make tiny changes in my input. Uh, and what how to how we can measure that is by calculating the gradient of this uh, hidden unit activation with respect to the input. In order to do that, I have to go back and 
I have to tell, tell PyTorch that I will actually want to calculate gradients with respect to the inputs. So I will say that input dot requires grad equals true. Um, and then I'm going to recompute the outputs. Now, probably because I didn't fix a random seed, this now generated a completely different output. Yes, it's a different output now. And now I can call the backward function on this, uh, on this scalar, which is going to backpropagate um, from starting from this output node uh, to the inputs. Now what happened is that the input, the input tensor uh, had uh, its gradient attribute prop, um, populated. We can look at what size it is. It's going to be the same size as the input itself. So it's going to be 100 by 1 by 1. So what, this, uh, what each of these 100 values is going to show you is what the gradient of the hidden unit activation at the end of the sequence is with respect to any of the input uh, symbols in the sequence. So I'm going to just uh... so um, there's a lot going on here. I simply uh, get rid of these dummy dimensions here. I detach this from PyTorch and the computational graph. This is, uh, this is important because I don't want to interfere with how gradients are calculated later. And I'm turning it into a NumPy array. And now that this is a NumPy array, I can plot its values. And hopefully this is going to work. So what we see here is, uh, I'm going to illustrate with this with dots. What I show here is the, the gradient of the, of the RNN's hidden layer activation uh, with respect to the input at any time step. So this is the gradient with respect to the input at time step one, and this is the gradient with respect to the input at time step 100. I'm only really interested in the gradients of this uh, or the, the magnitude of this so I can square it because sometimes this gradient is negative, sometimes this gradient is positive. I'm only interested in how big the gradients are. And what I can see is that the gradients are larger the closer you are to time step 100, which means that the hidden layer activation is very sensitive to whatever the last um, X was, the last input was um, in the sequence, whereas the uh, the gradient becomes very, very small with respect to uh, things that happened in this sequence in previous time steps. And I can illustrate that even better if I, if I switch to a logarithmic axis. So uh, the, the X axis is now still the time steps and the Y axis is the, the logarithmic, uh, the logarithm of the, or the uh, logarithmic axis showing the magnitude of the gradient of the hidden layer activation at the end with respect to the input at that level. And you can see that the influence of each input degrades uh, exponentially as you go back in time. And this is one illustration of how um, RNNs forget um, particular entries in the input sequence very quickly, exponentially quickly. And this is a very bad property because, for example, if you wanted to do translation, uh, you really have to remember what the beginning of the se sentence was uh, in order to then be able to translate it to a different uh, language. OK, so this was an illustration of the vanishing gradients problem. Uh, here is one other version of a graph that I've uh, previously obtained. This vanishing exploding gradients problem uh, happens a lot in vanilla recurrent neural networks. And so by vanilla recurrent neural networks, uh, I mean when every uh, layer is defined um, as a similar function to the functions that we had in multi-layer perceptrons. So for example, here the uh, T plus first uh, hidden state is defined as a linear function of the previous hidden state at T 
plus the input at time t plus some bias term and uh, and then we apply a layer by or an element wise nonlinearity sigma to it and then the output let's say uh, is a function a linear function of the of the final hidden state h capital t uh, with some nonlinearity or some uh, activation function uh, phi maybe it's a different one and so now we can look at how the this output, this predicted output at the end of the network, y hat, um, what the gradient of this function is with respect to intermediate hidden states, ht. Um, we can use uh, the, the chain rule like we, uh, we did in the automatic differentiation um, lecture. So the, the loss, the, the, the gradient of the empirical loss with respect to the hidden state at time t, uh, small t, is the product of all of these matrices, which is the, uh, this, this one is the gradient of the loss with respect to the, the final, sorry, there's a partial sign missing here, with respect to the final hidden layer activation, H capital T. And then here we have the Jacobians of each hidden state with respect to um, the previous hidden state at the previous time step. And this should be an S here as well. And this can further be decomposed. Uh, so each hidden state uh, is calculated from the previous hidden state in two steps. First of all, a linear mapping is applied and then uh, a nonlinearity is applied. Uh, so this matrix, Jacobian matrix here, in fact, decomposes into the product of two matrices, uh, a D matrix denoted by D here, which is a diagonal matrix that contains the gradients of the nonlinearity that we applied. So if, it, if this is the value, then the gradients are very simple. It's either zero or one. So this is a diagonal matrix with say zeros and ones in the diagonal. And then you have the W, which is the, the weight matrix that connects the, uh, the subsequent time steps to, together. Uh, and you have actually capital T minus T different version, different times, you have the same matrix. So you have the, this matrix raised to the T minus T uh, power. Using this uh, formula, we can upper bound the gradient itself. And we can show that this gradient uh, with respect to the hidden state at time T is going to be upper bounded by this gradient times uh, the norm of this gradient times the norm of this uh, activation gradient matrix and the norm of the weight matrix raised to the power capital T minus T. Uh, and from this, you can see that uh, essentially the norm of this matrix, the norm of the weight matrix is going to influence the size of this gradient very much. If WH is a matrix that has a very large norm, uh, then the gradient might explode. And if WH is a matrix that has very small norm, then the, then the gradient eventually will vanish uh, and, ex and does so exponentially quickly because it's raised to a certain power. Um, so one idea and mathematically very elegant idea of fixing this is described in this quite recent paper, Unitary Evolution RNNs. The idea here is that we can constrain this weight matrix to be unit norm. And if you constrain this weight matrix to be unit norm, then we can, uh, during training, so it cannot, the norm stays constant and it stays at one, then uh, the gradient can neither explode or vanish uh, during training. And the way this particular paper does it is by constructing unit norm matrices from very simple unit norm matrices that we know how to parametrize and use. So examples of unit norm weight matrices would be, um, uh, things like geomet they, they usually have geometric interpretation, like reflection, uh, reflection around a particular vector, uh, or it can be a permutation of indices, or it can be something like the Fourier transform or the inverse Fourier transform. In this paper, uh, they chose a particular weight matrix uh, form that is essentially a product of a bunch of these simple unitary matrices. Each of these does something very simple, but if you concatenate a bunch of them in a quasi-random order, then you can uh, parametrize relatively complex weight vectors 
or weight matrices uh, without changing the norm, because the norm of each of these operations is one, the norm of its product is also going to stay one. So this is one nice elegant mathematical way of preventing um, this exploding or vanishing radiance problem to, to happen. This is not very widely used though. Uh, I, I showed this to you because I find it a very elegant illustration of the mathematical problem that we are, um, that we are dealing with. What's much more commonly used uh, as a solution to the forgetting problem is gating. And uh, here, here is a, a walkthrough of how gating works. Remember the vanilla RNN simply calculated the next hidden state as, uh, as, as a linear transformation of the previous hidden state and the input plus some nonlinearity. And now we are going to introduce a new type of operation that is different from just a, a multiplication by a matrix or an element-wise uh, nonlinearity. We are going to introduce element-wise products between um, different data dependent uh, terms in the neural network. I think I'm going to walk through this from the bottom. Uh, the, and this particular uh, type of recurrent neural network is called the gate, uh, gated recurrent unit or GRU, uh, which was relatively recently introduced. Uh, and it's, it's I think simpler than, uh, than the most commonly used ones. Um, it, defines two gate variables. So given the, the input and given the current value of the hidden state, uh, it defines uh, two variables, R, which is called the reset gate, and Z, which is called the update gate. And uh, here we use a nonlinearity, which is the sigmoid function, which takes values between zero and one. So you can think of the, this R and Z values as almost binary values. It's like soft binary values. They can take values between zero and one. Then we calculate this uh, updated version of the hidden state, which, is, which depends on the current input. And if the corresponding reset gate is set to one, then it also depends on the previous value uh, or the current value of uh, of the hidden state HT. If RT uh, is closer to zero, then this RT has the option to override and essentially cancel out this second term. Uh, so RT, which is the reset gate, can prevent this uh, updated hidden state to depend on the previous hidden state. And this is why it's called the reset gate because if this RT value is uh, close to zero, uh, this hidden state is essentially going to be reset to a completely new value. It's only going to depend on the input. It's not going to depend on whatever its value was previously. Uh, but this is not, not the updated value yet. The next value of the hidden state is going to be um, uh, zt times ht. This circle notation is a Hadamard product. It's an element-wise multiplication. So um, this is essentially a almost like a binary choice at this formula. If zt is one, then we are going to make ht plus one equal ht, which means that we are not changing, changing the hidden state at all. We are ignoring everything that happened in this time step and we are going to continue uh, propagating the previous hidden state from time t to be also the hidden state at time t plus one. But uh, for, for coordinates where ZT takes a value closer to one, we are instead going to use this updated formula. So ZT uh, determines whether each component of the hidden state is going to be updated at all in this time step. And RT is going to determine uh, for those uh, hidden state coordinates that are updated, whether the update is going to be uh, taking into account the previous value of the hidden states or whether it's going to be reset to a completely new value. An image uh, or a, a picture describing this GRU unit is, is here. Uh, so these Z and R gates are um, um, kind of usually drawn like this. So Z has the ability to flip between H being updated to itself 
which is going through this loop, or if you flip this gate to the other position, then it's going to go through this path, uh, in which case it's going to be updated with this H tilde. And R determines whether H tilde um, takes into account the previous value H or, it's, or it completely resets the value around X. So this is GRU. And um, obviously the reason why this solves the forgetting problem is because via this, um, these reset gates and the, up, uh, and the update gates, this GRU unit has the opportunity to essentially keep a memory indefinitely long. So if, if this Z gate never flips over to this side, it stays as it is currently drawn, then uh, we are never going to change the hidden state uh, for that particular unit. Uh, and this means that we can keep a memory much, much longer uh, compared, to, um, compared to a normal RNN. And I want to close with just talking a little bit about LSTMs, which is a more complex version of something like the GRU, but it actually predates the GRU. Uh, it has many, many more gates. Uh, and in fact, I don't even know uh, how many gates in, in particular it has. It was introduced by uh, Sepp Hochreiter and Jürgen Schmidhuber in the, in the 90s, um, but it has been improved and tweaked on several times since then. So the LSTMs that we use today are slightly different from what they introduced back then. Uh, it has more gates than the GRU to control behavior. Um, in 20, 2009, uh, another Alex, this is a different Alex from the AlexNet Alex, uh, has used an LSTM-based network uh, to, to beat everybody else in the handwriting recognition competition. So that was a big breakthrough for LSTMs in a practical benchmark challenge. And this predates the LXNet uh, 2012 breakthrough. Um, and then LSTMs have also set a, a bunch of new records in natural speech um, modeling, um, I, uh, which is uh, generating natural speech from text. In 2014 uh, is when the GRU was introduced instead of the LSTM. So GRUs are much more uh, like simpler to understand and explain and also more parameter efficient than the LSTMs. And uh, 2016 is another milestone, which is when Google introduced neural machine translations. So this was the year when they replaced whatever previous system they used for Google Translate with an an essentially LSTM sequence to sequence based uh, neural machine translation system. And it's now been replaced by a transformer based architecture, which I think Nick is going to maybe talk about. Um, but it's, this, this has been a very, very influential type of um, recurrent neural network module. So, so I have to dive across to do, listen to part two project presentations, maybe to some people in the audience here. Um, can I sort of pause the recording there and, and jump out? Um, yeah, basically. Uh, there's a few questions, I guess, if you're happy to stay on. I'm seeing Robert's just put a question in. So I'm gonna 